It is so great to be here. I said so in class, I won't go through it again, but it's my first time to be in Bowling Green, certainly my first time here with this local work. Everyone's been so welcoming and kind. I'm thankful that you've come to worship God. We're doing that together. And part of what we like to do is get into the Word and let God work on us so that Sunday just begins a great week. It's a start. It sets us in the right direction. Uh, I laid out a little bit in the class what our theme would be for the week. You will hear this term quite often, this idea of missions of mercy. And these are two really great words. Mission has this concept of direction and purpose. You know why you're here. You know why the Lord has saved you. You know there's work to do. And we just need to figure out what does that work look like and how do you go about doing it. And so we started with that a little bit. The second word is also really important because as you'll find, while it is teaching and sharing and helping, ultimately, it's taking the mercies that God has put into your life, for which you are thankful every day, and it is submitting those into the lives of other people. Missions of mercy. Most of you do not know me at all. I'm just some guy from Texas who got here last night, and so I didn't expect you to hop on board quite so quickly. I thought it's going to take me a few times to try to get them on board with this mission of mercy stuff. But I just listened to 300 people commit themselves, so thank you for doing that. Your verbal commitment is a legally binding contract. Well done. You're saying, what is he talking about? I'm talking about the song that we just sang together, 520, Seeking the Lost. Verse 3, you might remember. Verse 3, thus I would go on missions of mercy. We just said that. Following Christ from day on to day. Cheering the faint... Raising the fallen, pointing the lost to Jesus the way. Now, if this is anything like Lindell or anywhere else, there were a few of you just sitting there quietly during that song, not saying a thing. Well, okay, you're uncommitted, and I'm here for you, and we're going to work on you. But most of us were all in on that. In fact, this is one of those great songs that has the bass lead in the chorus. Who likes the bass lead? My wife told me to never sing in any sermon ever, but here we go. Going afar, you guys like that? Upon the mountain, isn't that great? Like, I know it was bad, but that, we did that together, and the men led, and their, their wives and children followed in behind them. But look at what we said. We said we're going to go afar, up on a mountain, to bring a wanderer back again. You want to talk about a gut check? I got a question for you. And I know some people are going to be like, yesterday. But for most of us, like, when's the last time you did that? When's the last time you were like Jesus in the case of Zacchaeus? And you walked away from what you were doing and you went and climbed a difficult mountain. And you put in effort and you were sweating and you made sacrifice. Just because someone had wandered away and you wanted to go bring them back. Like, really? Really? We sang it so courageously and, and as if it was the rule for our lives. And it should be the rule for our lives. But what we want to talk about this week is why should I go up on those mountains? How should I go up on those mountains? And what are a few things I may need to work on inside of myself in order to get that going? That's kind of what we'll be doing this week. We started in the class by looking, first of all, in Luke 19 at the story of Jesus going to Zacchaeus. And spending time at his house, and that's the kind of children of God that we need to be. But then we delved into three stories together, and I, I mean, most of you were here, and you can listen, so I won't take all day on it. But I would submit to you that going on missions of mercies and singing about it is good and wanting to do it, but it is only possible for people who have a heart like God's heart. We have to love people the way God loves people. We know from the Bible that God loves every person. We know that Jesus died for every person. We know that no person is more important to God than any other person. No person is better to God via accomplishment than any other person. Every soul matters. Like, we totally know that. But are we living like we know that? Jesus, in the first story, left the 99 sheep to go after the one. He went all the way out to get the sheep. He put the sheep on his shoulders. He brought the sheep back home and he threw a party. As I told you in class, that story hits me right between the eyes because I'm not a whole lot like Jesus all the time. I don't know that I'd leave the 99 to go and find the one. Some of us think that if we gather with the 99 on Sunday, that's really all God wants us to do. And we forget from Luke chapter 15 that there's more rejoicing in heaven for who we go get 
than who we already have assembled. I've got to love that one sheep just like God does. And then we looked at the idea of the woman and the coin, and I submitted to you that that represented the church and the completeness of all who have become a part of, say, this local church. And if some drift away, we need to go and get them. As I said earlier, and I'm just suggesting this thinking, if somebody leaves this church for the world, we ought to consider ourselves less complete before our husband than we were before. And we want to try to rectify that. And then, of course, the last story we know really well, the prodigal son, but it's not really about the prodigal son. It's actually about a father who was willing to show compassion and run to his son and not wait for him to fix everything, but say, you're here and that's all I wanted, and he throws the great party for him. And ultimately, in all these lessons, we just want to make sure you and I are more like the father and less like the other brother. The other brother was thinking about himself. He was comparing himself to his brother. He was self-centered, and he missed the entire point of what was going on. And so ultimately, we want to love like he loves. But part of that, go to Matthew 18. That's where we'll be for pretty much all we're doing this morning. In Matthew chapter 18, part of that is Jesus needs to tell us how to do it. Because you might leave here this morning and say, I'm in. I know exactly who to call. I know exactly who to visit. I know exactly who I'm going to reach out to. I want to love them. I want them to know that I love them. And we're going to pray for the Lord's help. But if we don't go the right way, we cause more damage in the going than if we had not gone. And yet we don't have the option to not go. So where does that leave you? It leaves you in a position where you say, Lord, I need you to show me how to be merciful. I need you to show me how to carry out this mission. And that's why I've got you in Matthew 18. Because you're going to get four thoughts from this text on how it is that we go to people once we've decided that we love them. And that God loves them. And that this is important to him. So let's do this together. It won't take too long this morning. That's something that preachers just say, but I kind of mean it. But let's read the first four verses and get started. First verse. At that time the disciples came to Jesus, Matthew 18 and verse 1, and said, Who then is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And he called a child to himself, and he set him before them, and he said, Truly I say to you, unless you are, and I'm reading from the New American Standard Version, by the way, unless you are converted and become like children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever then humbles himself as this child, he is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Okay, a little bit of the setup here. In the story this morning, both the Zacchaeus story and the other passage that we were looking at, Jesus was kind of saying that the Pharisees were off. That they thought they were better than everyone else and they built walls around themselves and they kept others out. This time, though, he's not talking to the Pharisees. He's talking to those A-listers I mentioned this morning. He's talking to the super Christians. The best of the best, the faithful of the faithful. He's talking to the apostles. And what do the apostles argue about on a day-to-day basis? Which one of us is the best? Which of us is doing it the most right? Which of us has accomplished this most? the most? Who is the greatest? Two of the brothers sent their mom in to argue for ultimate positioning in heaven. Like they, and the other guys did not like that. Who is the greatest? Jesus says, do you want to know what greatness looks like in my kingdom? You say, well, yeah, I want to know exactly what it looks like. How do I become great? He says, go get that child off the street right there. You know, back in that culture, this could have been a child of a family that had gathered up, or it could be just one of the the kids on the streets that had no one to care for them. Bring that child to me. And this helpless, totally dependent, completely vulnerable, powerless child sits on Jesus' lap, completely vulnerable to whatever Jesus would do for him or against him. No way of defending himself. And Jesus says, unless you become converted to be like this child, you will never be great in the kingdom of heaven. And so comes our first lesson. Until there is humility, until everyone in this room, even the best dressed of us, even the loudest singer among us, even the one who has now been to 432 Sunday mornings in a row, even though you had COVID that one time, Even if you are the most faithful of all, you are never more than just a helpless child on Jesus' knee, completely vulnerable to what he chooses to do. You are in need. You're in need of grace. You're in need of peace. 
You're in need of things that only he can provide to you. None of us are ever great by our accomplishments, by our merit. So there is never a gap between you and anyone else. Because we are all equally leaning in on the breast of Jesus, pleading for him to give us mercy. It appears that Jesus was a bit concerned that some of these men had elevated themselves. So when they walked around and looked at others, they would see, here we are, here you guys are. Now the problem with this is, if it's us and the world, and we're here and they're here, they may not be worthy of our attention. Or we may send this message, be careful with this message. Oh, you want to be a Christian? You want to go to the West End Church? You want to do well? Well, you kind of need to become like us. Like you're here and we're here, and you're kind of going to want to get on board with us. They don't need to be more like me in order to get to heaven. They need the grace of Jesus, and they need to be led by the Son of God. So part of what he's doing is he's saying you have to see how humble and lowly you are so that when you go to someone, you will go to them humbly. How many of you know, it doesn't matter if it's a family member, if it's your best buddy, if it's someone that you used to worship with, if it's a complete stranger on the street or a co-worker, if you go to them to try to affect change in their lives and they pick up even a syllable of your speech that sounds like you think you're better than they are, it's over. Nothing you say will matter. Nothing will be heard. If they see you looking down on them like you need to become more like me, then it is finished. And I have very much communicated with people like that. And I go, well, I guess they didn't want to hear the gospel. I guess they didn't want to do what's right. If they were like me, they would have. Good grief. He said you need to be humble. And let me show you what it looks like. I think you'll like this. Hold your place here in Matthew chapter 18 and go to 1 Timothy 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1, I love the attitude of the Apostle Paul. I would imagine that everywhere he went to preach the gospel or everyone he was trying to encourage, he would say something like this so they understood who was trying to help them. 1 Timothy chapter 1 and in verse 12, the Apostle Paul says this, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has strengthened me because he considered me faithful, putting me into service. Let me tell you about me. I was formerly a blasphemer. I was a persecutor. I was a violent aggressor. Yet I was shown mercy. I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was more than abundant. 1 Timothy 1, 14. With the faith and love which are found in Christ Jesus. He says, it's a trustworthy statement. It deserves full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Among whom I am what? Foremost of all. Yet for this reason, I found mercy, so that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. And then he says this, Now to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Here's how Paul approached people. You think you're a sinner? I'm the worst of the worst. I'm unworthy to be saved, I'm unworthy to be loved, and Lord knows I'm unworthy to actually be used in his service. If anyone doesn't belong, I don't belong. But if the Lord would accept me, I promise he can accept you. I don't need you to come up and be like me. I'm down here with you, unworthy and in need, but God has blessed me. Will you let him bless you too? Does that sound a little bit different than, you know, you really need to straighten up? Like I'm straightened up. It's very different. It's mercy-based and driven. Let me give you a quick story to kind of illustrate this. Um, several years ago, uh, one of my family members left the faith. That, that hurts. It's one of the most painful things to watch a, a family member that you love drift off into the world, and, and he did that. And I did not take that well. Uh, I was very upset. I was emotional about it. And honestly, I just became very rude. I don't know. I don't want to use profanity on day one. Well, I try not to use profanity ever. But I don't know if we use this word. But I just became like a jerk. Like I, was, I couldn't be around him. I read all the disfellowship passages and I kicked them all up to 11. And I, when I was in the room, I wouldn't look at him. I couldn't. I was just so 
angry and he needed to change and doesn't he see and then and then like the family started kind of turning against us you know and I'm like we're the ones standing for the truth I mean don't you guys see where we are and and it, it was just so so hard and difficult and then it just hit me I was studying this it hit me that if that man ever decided to come back to the church guess who he was never going to call he was never going to call me so I called him up I said, can we go and have some lunch together? And he reluctantly met me halfway between our homes. This is a few years back. And we had lunch together. And he knew what was coming. I was going to lecture him again on life changes, but not this time. This time I said, man, all I want to do today is I want to apologize. Like, you know where I stand on things biblically, but I've been unkind. I've been dismissive and rude. I've not shown an ounce of compassion and honestly, it's been about me more than it's been about you. And I am sorry. And you know what he did in response to that? I'm supposed to tell you he got up and hugged me. Is that what I'm supposed to say? He twisted that knife on me. And it hurt. He's like, you know what? You're right. You did do that. You did make it like that. And it, I, mean, I don't know if I've ever felt inside pain like I felt on that. Because what did I want to do? I wanted to hop out and go, no, wait a minute. Let's just get back to clarity. Right, wrong. Good, bad. I'm doing you a favor by coming. That's every ounce of me wanted to do that. But instead, I just sat there and I took it and it hurt. But at least he knew that I was having a change of heart. A couple of years later, he came back to the Lord. And guess who he called? He called me. Folks, he needed to change. But first, I needed to be converted. You say, what do you mean needed to be converted? I mean what it says right here. Go back to Matthew 18. Matthew 18, he's not talking to lost people telling them that the lost needs to be converted, though we know that the lost needs to be converted. The lost is, and let's see, you're looking at me this direction, left, right. Okay, the lost is outside of Christ and they need to be converted inside of Christ. Like everybody knows that. My family member was outside of Christ. He needed to be changed to be inside of Christ. But the text, when it talks about conversion, it's not talking about lost people being converted to Christ. It's talking about followers of Christ being converted from here down to here. There's a lot of work God wants to do in your life. And a lot of people are going to change, but not until you are converted from high to low to a place of humility, dependency, spirituality, and love. Number one, we have to be humble. Let me show you a second thing in the text. Just pick up with me. All four are found in Matthew chapter 18. I want to begin in verse 5. He changes the, the narrative of the child a little bit. Instead of being one, he kind of pictures it as someone outside of you that you're dealing with. So pick up in verse 5. He said, whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for him to have a heavy millstone hung around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. He said, woe to the world because of its stumbling blocks. For it is inevitable that stumbling blocks come. But woe to that man through whom the stumbling block comes. He said, look, and he's talking to disciples. He's talking to people like you and me. If your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it from you. For it would be better for you to enter life crippled or lame than to have two hands or two feet to be cast into the eternal fire. If your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out and throw it from you. It's better to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be cast into the fiery hell. See that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I say to you, their angels in heaven continually see the face of my Father who is in heaven. 4 verse 11, the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. Now, I'm familiar with this plucking and cutting stuff. I mean, you guys remember that from the Sermon on the Mount. If your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out, or your hand, or your foot, or whatever. But I thought that had to do with lust, and immorality, and pornography, and, you know, beating up your computer with a baseball bat, which is a really good idea. It does apply to that. But do you know what it applies to here? It applies to the way... ...that you interact with impressionable believers, new Christians, 
messy situations. And I think actually people who are lost, the, the child here is someone who, who how you treat them is actually going to make a difference. How you approach them is actually going to tell the story. And he might be talking about young Christians who still don't know their way and they're weak. But verse 10 and verse 11 talks about the lost. So it would also apply to people in your life who are lost, but also impressionable. And he said, just be careful. Be careful how you talk to them. Be careful the attitude that you use. Be careful the way that you try to help them. I imagine it this way in this stage here that, that Jesus has seen a sheep that has wandered away. Maybe it was someone who was in the church and after all the COVID stuff, they've just kind of lost their way. Or, or maybe it was someone who's not yet become a Christian, but they've drifted into sin and, and that sheep runs off and Jesus says, I'm going to get him. I'm going to go get him and pick him up. And so Jesus gets all the way over there and the sheep is right on the edge of a chasm. I mean, it's just about ruined everything. And just before the sheep falls off, Jesus finally kind of gets in perfect position and he's reaching down and he's about to grab this sheep and save it. But here I come running at full speed. I'm a sheep that's going to help. I'm going to come and I'm going to do this for Jesus. I'm going to bring that sheep back and Jesus is going to be super proud of me. So I come run. I'm a four-legged monster. I'm running up and I'm going to save the sheep and I reach around and I bump him. Just before Jesus can get his hands on him. I come in to fix it, and I break it. Something tells me there are going to be two sheep at the bottom of the chasm that day. Isn't that kind of the point that he's making? He's saying, these are little ones that I want to assist and help. They're seekers. They're people who are hurt, who are looking for healing. They're broken, and they're looking to be repaired. Be careful how you interact with them. I'll give you a couple of stories to help concrete that into place and and I think I'll talk a little bit about like church setting and people who come and visit our church or I told you in the class that there are probably members here who've drifted who would like to come back but they're ashamed they're humiliated they feel like they don't fit in they feel like they'll be judged you say we don't we wouldn't do any of that we would welcome them well they don't they don't know that but I remember a story from a handful of years ago where there was a family that had drifted from our fellowship that a few of us were trying to get to come back and they came back, and they hadn't been there in, in months. And they walk in, and a few people are there, and up comes this couple. You guys know this, like this couple's always there. They're the, they're, they've never missed a service. Like they, I don't know, they're always, it's just good. It's a very good thing. But they walk over, and I'm just watching it in slow motion. And I watch them walk over and tap the guy on the shoulder, and he looks, and they go, been missing you around here. And they walk off. And I look at the man, and he goes, and he looks at his wife, and I walk up, and I'm like apologizing. And he looks at me, and he goes, Chris, who even was that? And I thought, that's it. That's exactly what we're talking about. The Lord's like pulling and tugging and helping, and we come up, well, you know, just so you know. Nice that you're making a few steps. And we end up discouraging and pushing than doing what she should have done. What should she have done? She should have brought her husband over and said, it is amazing to see you. God is so good to us, and we're glad. Hey, would you like to come and have lunch at our house? Just please, come over. and have, Like, that's what she should have done. But there wasn't that sense of humility and care. I'll give you a story that's even more recent than that. Two days ago, I was visiting with one of the older ladies of our church who stepped out in fear at the time of COVID and has not yet come back. So we've been working on sweetest lady on earth and we go visit her some and, and I was over there visiting her a couple of days ago and I was kind of walking her through it, you know, and, and she's a little bit older. So she was like, I almost came last Sunday, but I didn't have anything to wear. Like, you know, she's just trying to like process her way back through this. She lost her husband a few years ago. And she said, you know, I almost came two weeks ago and I was getting ready. And, and actually my sister who's lost her faith over the years was going to come back. And I was like, great. And she said, but you know, I got a, I got a letter in the mail a couple of days ago. From a, from a member at church. I said, yeah, yeah, Chris, you know this person. I, I really know this person. And, and all it said was that I'm in sin and I'm letting my children run my life. It was this whole thing that a lot of which wasn't, it just discouraged her so badly that she almost doesn't want to go back because it would be like, like giving over to the other person and she doesn't want to face them. Like, let's not be that person. 
Let's be the person that visits and encourages and listens and understands. Because look, it's messy out there. And people are going to walk through the door of this building. You guys have already seen it. They're going to walk through, like I said, in class with tattoos on their faces, like Gary at our church and the guy named Kid. Or they're going to walk through the door and with shorts on. Or they may have a Yeti cup with coffee in it. I'm not making any comments or judgments. There may be all these, and we're going, that's not like we and that, and I don't, that, I don't you know what, I don't know if that's going to work for us. There's going to be all these stories and problems, and, and I think that's part of how we cull candidates in the world. We look at someone and we go, I don't know that they would fit in at our church. I mean, there's so much they need to kind of think about and change in order to be at our church. But if we were like Paul, we'd say, our church is filled with people who sin and need the Lord and have found them. Our church is filled with imperfect people who wear our tattoos on the inside, if you know what I'm saying. Our scars and our problems. But we need Jesus. What's this deal about trying to just be careful is what I'm saying. There was a case last year or so at our church where we've been working with these people at a mission, at a rehab mission, these men. And there's all these kind of baptisms going on. It's really cool. It's engaged our church. It's kind of changed our church, made us more mission oriented and understand our real purpose, which is giving these people a family that they've never had many of them before and so they were gathered in the back and we had a baptism on a Sunday and and one of the men and, and as they came up from the water the back two rows started clapping in East Texas I, I don't care what you th- we're not, I don't care what you think about that I'm not debating on that I'm not saying it's right or it's wrong but I am telling you that what should happen in a case like that You shouldn't just be like, somebody go fix it. You should be like, I need to have these people over to my home. I need to hear their stories. I need to find out what's going on in their lives. I need to see why they celebrate like that. Maybe in some ways you don't have to do this, but I should be celebrating more like them instead of them more like me. And then if I I need to correct them, let's say that's wrong. I'm not making any, I'm not, let's just say that's wrong. And you need to fix them. Well, you know what? You got to love them first. And they have to love you and trust you and know your story and feel connected. And then you go in and say, and we did that with those men. We said, it's not kind of the way we roll here in in the East Texas church. And they were like, okay, we've got to be careful. Because that's the way it is in the world. But if we're thinking those people won't fit in with us, then we don't know who we are. We're just the people who need the Lord. And I think everybody would fit in as people who need the Lord. Let me give you a third thought here, and we'll speed up through these last couple. But, you know, you might get to this point and be like, you know what, I, I don't think this is for me. Like, I, I've, I wrote down a few names. I, I know some people I need to go, maybe even apologize to, and I'm going to have to be really careful. But, man, this sounds kind of scary. I mean, Jesus said if I do this wrong and the sheep falls off, that it would be better for me to be drowned in the sea with a stone than to face Jesus. You know what, I think I'm, I'm hands off. I'm not going to reach out to anybody. I'm not going to try to convince someone to study the gospel. I'm going to leave that up to the pros. The problem is we don't have that option either. Because the Lord calls all of his people to be engaged in your mission. You can't be mission oriented and not be working towards the mission. So look in chapter 18. I'll begin in verse 12. You know this story. Matthew chapter 18, 12. What do you think? If any man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the 99 on the mountains and go and search for the one that is straying? If it turns out that he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than the 99 which had not gone astray. So it is not the will of the Father who is in heaven that even one of these little ones should perish. If your brother sins, and as I read this, let me say, I think this is probably talking about believers, but there's this grander sense of brotherhood too I think we should think about that anybody in your life who's in sin anybody who needs correction God loves them all but I'm okay if you think about this in terms of church fellowship if your brother sins go show him his fault in private if he listens to you you've won your brother if he does not listen to you then go get two more one or two more so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses every fact may be confirmed if he doesn't listen to them tell it to the church if he refuses to listen even to the church let him be to you as a gentile and a tax collector truly i say to you whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven you say okay how does this work i need to go seek out some souls i know their names i know exactly the situation what do i do you go to them It's private, it's on your own, it's out of love, it's personal, and it is for the purpose of saving them. You say, I've tried that, I don't know that I got through. Well, do you know two or three more people who love them? 
and who they love. You take those and you work on it. And then if it's something about the church, you don't get up and I, I just got here. I don't know how things go here. But you don't get up and say, well, we have chosen to disfellowship these people for whatever. You get up and say, church, one of our coins has fallen into the corner of the room. Go get them. Let's take the next three weeks and let's just go encourage, make some calls, do some things. Let's try to bring them back. And then, yes, if, if they will not listen, if they will not change, then they have to be outside of this fellowship. The, the disfellowship passages in the New Testament are largely about people who have a negative influence on a local church. And you have to kind of push them away. But these people have kind of already gone. But there may be a time for disfellowship. But let's make that their call, not yours, if you know what I'm saying. Like you're going and they refuse to come back. This text is so crucial about the way that we go to others. And you say, well, I, I don't know. Should I be doing this? Well, what does Galatians 6 say? It says, if anyone's caught in a trespass, who is supposed to go to them? Who's supposed to go? You who are what? Spiritual. All right, I don't know. I don't sense this is a hand-raising church. I don't mean like, eh, I mean like this. Maybe I mean both. But like, are you spiritual? If, if we, you got in here this morning and I just said, hey, really quickly, I'm just interested in who's spiritual today. And if you would just, I know we're not going to, but if you would just do this, that'd be great. I think everybody in the room would go, I'm spiritual. And I would say, well, tell me, how would you prove that you are spiritual? You'd say, I'm at worship. Good. I'm singing. I read my Bible. I love, Great. You are spiritual. Listen carefully, spiritual person. Let's go take a look. I don't know what time it is. I don't care. Go to Galatians 6. Go to Galatians 6. Look at it with me. I'm optimistic about this. But we have to kind of get it. We have to receive it and say, yes, this is, this is me. Brethren, even if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. Missions of wrath. Missions of judgment. Missions of be more like me. No, no, and no. It's missions of mercy. So we go in gentleness. We're offering the mercy of the Lord to them. Restitution in the, the blood of Jesus. So that you too will not be tempted. You bear one another's burden and you thereby fulfill the law of Christ. If you're spiritual, then go. If you're not going, let's work on your spirituality. Let's fly a guy in from Texas and see what happens. That's kind of what this is. This is like, hey, let's work on our spirituality so that we can do these things. I want to say one more thing about Matthew 18, and then we'll wrap it all up. Matthew, that's another thing preachers sometimes say. I, I do pretty much mean that. Look in Matthew 18. This is often called a disfellowship passage. Matthew 18, 15, 16, and 17. This is the road to disfellowship. If you're going to mark them or uh, not eat with them, or whatever, this is the road. Folks, this is not a disfellowship passage. This is a fellowship passage. This is how do we restore fellowship? How do we do that? How many of you guys know that God is not a disqualifier? God is a qualifier. God is looking for any reason, every reason, any indication on anyone's part to save them and qualify them. The last thing in the world God wants to do is kick people out of heaven so that heaven will have a nice formal look to it. That's not the way Jesus is. I want you here. And they do look like us. No matter what's on their face or how long their pants are, they do look like us, sinners who need the Lord. And what we need to do is we need to be useful and the spiritual people need to be on mission. Because while preachers can carry on some of this and elders can, restoration comes through personal contact. And I just told you earlier, it may hurt a little bit. That conversation with my family member was painful. And I'm really thankful for the pain. Because of the outcome. Let me give you one more thought. Uh, this is a long story, but we don't need to spend all morning in it. In the end, we need to be merciful, which is kind of the point we've been making all along. We humble ourselves. we cautious in our approach. We definitely are going. And then you get this story. And I, I think we know it well. We'll just finish with a look at it. Uh, Peter kind of comes back with, how often do we forgive? Like, how humble must we be? How long must we work with them? And Jesus says 490 times. I actually have a couple of friends who are up in the 300s. So they have about 150 more and then I'm done. Uh, but 490 isn't like that. And I make that, you know, that's not serious. But I wonder how many, I just kind of wonder how many tally marks Jesus has on me. How many of you guys think you haven't gotten to 490 yet? Anybody? 
I have this really cool sense that Jesus isn't even tallying. And I kind of like that. I wonder if maybe we could be more like Jesus. All right, in the story, he says, let me tell you a story that'll, that'll end this thing. He says there was this, this master who was settling accounts, verse 24. This guy comes to him. He owes 10,000 talents. It's like $7 billion or something. It's a lot. But since he did not have the means to repay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, sell his wife, sell his kids, sell everything until repayment be made, which would never be able to be made. So the slave fell to the ground and prostrated himself before him, saying, Have patience with me and I'll repay you everything, even though he, he couldn't. And the Lord of that slave felt compassion, mercy, compassion, and released him and forgave his debt. Now you know what that is. That's the story of how you came to be in the graces of God. You were a child who sat on Jesus' knee. He forgave you insurmountable debt and he continues to do so. And so this guy goes out and says, I'm going to be like God. No. No. In the very next verse, it says that the slave went out and he found a fellow slave who owed him a hundred denarii. It's like 300 bucks. And he seized him and he began to choke him saying, pay back what you owe. And, and the slave falls to the ground and says, have patience with me and I'll repay you. But this man wasn't even willing to do that. And he went and threw the guy into prison until he should pay back what he owed. So how does the story end up? The story ends up that they go tattletale on him. They go back and say, you're not going to believe what this guy did. You did everything for him, and he did nothing for another. So summoning him, verse 32, the Lord said, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not also have had mercy on your fellow slave in the same way I had mercy on you? And his Lord, and this is just judgment language, his Lord moved with anger, handed him over to the torturers until he should repay all that was owed him. My heavenly Father will also do the same to you, to you, apostles, to you, A-listers, to you, faithful ones, if each, if each of you does not forgive his brother from your heart. Which is not just forgiveness when asked, it's a sense of mercy. It's a sense of extending time and patience and peace. Okay, the guy made two mistakes. If you were here for class, you know what the mistakes were. This guy made two mistakes that we simply must not make. They're the exact two mistakes that the elder brother made in the prodigal son story. Number one, this guy was focused on who? Me getting forgiven by God. I want God, gimme, gimme, neighbor, gimme, gimme. God, gimme, neighbor, gimme. Who's that always about? The mercies of the Lord was not to glorify the goodness of God. It was so that I could be free. And I'm not going to extend mercy to others because it's all about me. Let me just, tomorrow night, who's coming back tomorrow night? I'm sorry, who's? As long as, and I know it's, I know it's tough. I know you're going to go, oh, it's so tough, steel toe boot stuff. Hey, if I get hurt, you get hurt. It takes a little bit of pain to get where we need to go. But as long as it's about you, this, this really glorious change can't be unlocked. So we're going to dig in on that because that was his problem. Every, even the mercies of God were about him and certainly what he could get from people. And the second problem is the one that I think about very often. That's kind of, look, I'm folding every, everything up. That's kind of been the theme of the morning is what this man did is he compared himself to his fellow slave. And compared to his fellow slave, he was better than him. He owes me money. And he saw himself as better. And what he missed was if he had compared himself to his master instead of to this person who has sinned against him, he would see that God did this much for me. And really, he's just asking me to do. Got any math majors? What's 300 divided by 7 billion? Anybody? Times that by 100 and you'll get a percent. And it's teeny, teeny, tiny. God does this much for me. And he's way past 490. And he's putting these people right in front of me in my life who just need this much mercy from me. And it may be the very thing that brings them into the courts of God where they can have all their sins forgiven and be made whole again. I have a fear of one day standing at the gates, ready to go in, resume, preacher, church goer, all of that. And I'm about to go in and Jesus says, just really quick, Chris, would you look over at, at those 10 people standing over there crying? Because those people didn't make it. And I'm going to say, Lord, that's, 
That's terrible. And he's going to say, I'm not finished. Chris, those ten pay people, they all would have made it. Except for the way that you treated them. They're not here because of you. Look at me. Look at me. I'm not going out like that. I'm not doing it. I'm not. Are you? I'm not going out like that. It won't be because of a lack of mercy and involvement and humility on my part. It will be because of their choices. And the Lord can welcome me. And I want to get to heaven more than anything in the world. And my kids and everybody God puts in my life. And he's shown us how to do it. The question is, who's going to be great? Who's the greatest? This is great. If we can help you be great. We want to give an appeal to those who are already members of the church. Let's work on greatness together. It'll take some humility. Say, how do I become great? It may start with some tears, some admissions, some need for help. But that's kind of perfect, you know. And if you're not a child of God, can I just offer you a mission of mercy for a moment and say that whatever you've done, I've probably been right there with you. And I'm no better than you, and there's nobody here any better than you. The only difference is some of us enjoy the grace of the Creator that He wants to give you more than anything in the world. And He can provide it today as you repent of your sins, and He washes them away in this water, and you start off new and fresh and welcomed. We can help you. If that's what you want, come now as we stand and sing.